Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to have you. Welcome to this, the Africa Fashion International Masterclass. A call to action has been made. The theme is called Be You, Be Truly African. What does this mean? That's the question. To be truly African, particularly in the 21st century. These are some of the questions that we'll be exploring and that will, of course, assisted uh, by our panelists to explore even further. But also, I'm keen to know, and I'm sure you do too, to know about the role with which creatives, uh, singers, songwriters, uh, anyone in the fashion industry, what they can do to ensure that a true identity of being truly African is shaped. But we know that being young in Africa means that you don't want to be boxed, you don't want to be uh, told what to do. So are we actually boxing young Africans and telling them what to do? These are some of the questions that we'll be posing and I'm excited uh, to share those views amongst our panelists with you. But my name is Duma Lomo Totoane. It's a pleasure to be your host uh, this afternoon. And uh, just before we get straight into our conversation, uh, I just want to make mention of a few housekeeping rules. You know that uh, we live in South Africa uh, due to unprecedented uh, you know, circumstances. Should we experience load shedding? Just keep calm and be African, right? have a positive spirit. Uh, we'll keep the show going and make sure that this show goes on the road. And uh, of course, at the same time, if you need to make use of the ladies or the Jane's rooms, uh, you can find them on the third floor. So just make your way to the back and find the lives on the third floor. That's when you can make uh, use of the ladies and Jane's. But with that being said, also if you'd like to engage on social media uh, with other Africans, with the diaspora, you could do so by going on Twitter and uh, on social media, particularly Instagram and Twitter. We are at AFI underscore SA. So please don't be shy uh, to tweet or to share pictures and reels and lives about what's happening in this room and make sure we engage globally. AFI underscore SA, uh, social media platforms, but also on Facebook, Africa Fashion International, that's the full name, that you can engage with us and leave a comment uh, on our Facebook page. So with that being said, let's get straight into our program for this afternoon. I would like to, uh, of course, open up our conversation with uh, the founder of the Africa Fashion International. I mean, she is also the executive chairperson. Uh, the reason we're also having this conversation today because she saw a need to put Africa fashion on the global map. And she's done so through this uh, company and this organization. We've seen you know, African designers being propelled on the African and uh, global stages, but also partnerships with the likes of Mercedes-Benz, making this a reality. So without any further ado, please give a warm round of applause to Dr. Precious Muley Mutsip. Thank you. Thank you to Melo. And thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, today. Thanks to our online audience for being with us today. We really appreciate your presence. Our goal as African Fashion International has always been to support a network of African designers throughout the continent by connecting them with each other and also connecting them with global markets. People ask me, why did you start African Fashion International? I started African Fashion International because I love fashion, <laughs> but also because I wanted to make a real tangible difference in the world through the African creatives, African fashion, African jewelry, music, food, to create social change on our continent, but also to bring economic benefits, create jobs on our continent, and give women and our youth, the growing population of young people on the continent, to give them an opportunity. I can tell you that in the last 20 months, I've traveled to 20 different African countries on the continent. Mm. So, what I want to find out from our audience and those who are present here today, where are we all from? Please indicate to us, are you from North Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, or South Africa? Southern Africa. As well as our audience that is in the diaspora, we'd like to hear from you. I can tell you that in each of the countries that I've visited, 
I have been confronted with amazing energy from young people, women, youth, men, who are so passionate about who they are and how they express themselves. And it is this energy that really inspires me. I see such a bright future for African fashion, both on our continent as well as globally. AFI Masterclass, which we're having today, is also part of what we do in terms of educating our, our people, our designers, as well as uh, customers on African fashion, what it can be and what it is. So it's, we, we're here to learn from each other and to network. And I'd like to encourage all of you joining us online and those who are here with us today to please engage, ask your questions, um, you have a panel of experts here led our, by our very capable facilitator uh, to take this masterclass forward. So I want to wish you a very informative, insightful, and an exciting masterclass. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. P, uh, for those words of wisdom, but also thank you for uh, leading the conversation, the theme to me is a call to action, be you, be truly African, and that's why we're here, to truly explore what that means. Um, so in a moment, I will introduce our panelists to help us explore uh, this theme, but before we do, Dr. P, would you like to join us on the podium, should we? I am going to, to exit because I've already <laughs> told you we have a panel of experts as yeah. well as uh, experts joining us online, so thank you very much. I will be listening attentively. Thank right. you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. P. Another warm yeah. round of applause, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Precious Mule Mutsipa. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Anis. Let me come closer to me. All right, so we're about to get into it. And just before I introduce our panelists, if you may allow me just to further elaborate on, you know, the reason we're having this conversation. Uh, we know, you know, the great platform with which our designers, with which our filmmakers, our singers and songwriters have, they have great platforms, great influence. But what can they do with those platforms to further exacerbate and, you know, elaborate more on the African identity? Is it their responsibility? Is it you and I's responsibility? Whose role is it? Um, and can there be truly one type of African <laughs> identity? Or should we be merging it with emerging 21st century globalization as we experience it? So we'll be exploring all of that, including asking different questions so we can get different perspectives from our panelists, but keeping with the theme, be you, be truly African. Now, if you're joining us, of course, virtually as well, make sure that you do engage with us. We'd love to hear from you by posing your comments and your questions, and we'll be sure to share them with you, uh, you know, towards the end of this, uh, you know, engagement uh, by sharing, of course, uh, some of those uh, questions and comments and allowing our panelists to delve more into it. So without any further ado, allow me to please introduce to you um, our panelists joining me. Also from my left, right? Um, and the lady joining me from my far late is Ms. Yolanda Ngogodwan, of course, the acting head of uh, industry development at NFVF. We're also joined by Mr. Ricardo Macado, also, of course, popularly and professionally known as Ricky Rick. He's a singer, songwriter, and a record label owner under Cotton Club Records. On my right, we're also joined by Ms. Anissa Mpungwe, of course, the founder of uh, Law and Cloth and Ashes. But uh, we have two other panelists joining us virtually Virtually. And uh, we're also joined, of course, virtually by uh, Nkulim Langeni Berg, uh, the founder of the Nine Vites. Thank you so much for joining us, Nkuli. Also, Roberta Anan, the founder and managing partner of Anan Capital Partner. It's a pleasure for you both uh, for joining us, uh, of course, this afternoon. All right, so let's kick off this one with, of course, our panelists uh, right here in our live studio. Perhaps let me start with you, Ricky Rick. I mean, you have been, um, you know, dubbed, and I see this often even on social media as the one artist that listens to the youth. You listen to what young people are saying, you engage with them. What are they saying when it comes to being African? What is their idea and perspective of Africanism? Well, well I think now I'm, I'm from a hip hop background. So we grew up heavy, heavy into the hip hop scene and obviously hip hop is an American music, you know. Um, but somewhere in the middle of my career, or in the middle of my life, I'm not too old, but in the middle of my life, I started realizing that the hip-hop that we were trying to make wasn't a hip-hop that was touching 
other people that came from the places that we came from. It mm. wasn't the music that was relating to uh, kids in the neighborhoods that we grew up in, where, 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 where our families were, at the, at the huge events where you'd find 20,000 people. They wouldn't understand this type of hip hop that we're making. And we sort of started saying, are we able to take hip hop and South Africanize it mm. completely? Are we able to take our music and turn it into a music that is actually South African first and hip hop second? And um, through that journey, now I've sort of started to bump into artists who have completely taken that model and become 100% South African still watching the social media the way that they right. watch it, still watching uh, American movies and American TV, still influenced by the content that we get from overseas. But once they get into studio, their music is 100% South African. And, you know, that was really a cry from kids wanting to be understood by their own people first. Mm. Because when I started rapping, people would always say, how is someone in LA going to understand you? How is someone in New York going to understand you? And I was like, yeah, I need to get really good at English. And now the kids don't have to be really good at English. They're saying that we're going to bring ourselves and present it to you. And now it's going to the world at the fastest rate that it ever has. So yeah. I think kids have started to um, really not look overseas for the mm -hmm. inspiration. They know that they are the inspiration, especially musically. So we're starting to get to that sort of place. So I think the kids are saying that it's time for Africa right. to be the leading force in music. That's quite insightful for you to say. And it brings me to my next question to you, Nkuli, particularly because I know that you have engaged or rather sort of um, you know, merged your, your, your Zulu and Ndebele designs and presented them to the world. The same with that Rick is talking about how you know, the young hip hop artists in South Africa are saying, we will speak Isi Zulu, we'll speak Kasetswana and sell that to the world. I mean, what made you want to, first of all, incorporate those designs and say, the world will learn about these designs, the history that comes with these designs, and I will not compromise on, you know, not only the texture, uh, but also the heritage that comes with the designs and the, and the, the, the Africanism they represent. Nguli, I am struggling to hear you. I'm not sure if you are muted. Please just double check for me if you're muted. We're struggling to hear you from the side. Hi, can you hear me now? All right, it seems we're still struggling yep. to hear you, Nguli. Let's try and sort out those uh, technical issues with you. I cannot hear you at this point. Let me bring it back to you, perhaps in the meantime, Anissa, while we try and get Nguli back. Uh, and, and you're also a fashion designer, um, loincloth and ashes. Did you ever at some point get tempted to compromise the quality of you know, your brand, what you stand for yourself, uh, just in the name of presenting a global product to the global consumer and saying, hey, let me try and tweak this, or is it more of, hey, we can merge and collaborate as Africa and the world, but not so much as compromising? Um, I don't think compromise was ever something that was in my vocabulary when I was, uh, but starting my brand, uh, working with other designers, working with uh, other corporate uh, companies. I think having a very strong sense of identity is important for any kind of brand. Um, and having your voice and your story uh, becomes key to people really paying attention to you and what you have to say. And thankfully, um, because we get to see what Europe has been doing throughout the years in, in the fashion space, it's not so much that we compromise, we learn definitely from mm -hmm. what they do, but then we have our own, own voice, um, as Rick said earlier. Right. And that will always, as African people, whether north, south, east, east or west, we are, we are proud. <laughs> Anything that we do, we do it with pride. So why compromise that? Yeah. It's, it's almost, art. that's such an artificial, you know, way of thinking. So right. compromise was never, uh, not, not even part of the plan. Uh, uh, no, it cannot be. And, and you know, every time I, you know, see 
African designers, African filmmakers, singers, songwriters um, who are able to access the global market, that's a responsibility that you have. You're carrying the, the, the continent on your shoulders. There's absolutely no way you can compromise when so many people are on the continent in the diaspora are depending on you to tell the true African story. Let's see if we can get a hold of Unkuli once. Unkuli, perhaps you can just uh, say hi to me uh, just to check that I can hear you. You can hear me? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, Hello? I can hear you now. Thanks, Nkuli, for your patience. I can hear you now. So my question still remains. The Zulu and Ndebele designs that you've incorporated and uh, why that was so important for you? Thank you so much for inviting me. It's nice to speak to people back at home. I miss home so much. And um, so my initial uh, idea or the drive to do that was I think that for a very long time, the continent has been left out of the conversation about design um, and art. Like our stuff was called arty craft or uh, like, um, how do you say, curios and things like that. So my interest was to firstly get to a place where we are seen and that we've been doing this um, African people have been designing for centuries. African people have been making art for the uh, longest of time. Mm. Um, and to kind of like bring it back and say we've been there and we exist and we are around and we're doing cool things and we've been doing cool things um, for the longest time. So I think that was like the initial kind of motivation for me to just kind of like also celebrates these crafts that um, otherwise were not designed. And um, uh, so that was kind of like the initial. And then since then, since then it's kind of like evolved uh, into getting it right, getting the quality right, and uh, improving that we from the continent can produce work that is of international standard. And I think, yeah, that was the motivation for me. Yeah. And, and, and with that being said, I just wonder, uh, with so much respect that you give to your designs and so much commitment and care, sensitivity, if I may add as well, Yolanda, is there such a concept then as an emerging African identity? If so, what are its features then? I think as Africans, we are so, we're so diverse and so different. And therefore, the, the question around, is there such a thing? as African identity, it's very complex and very, um, and almost broad in a sense that our experiences of being African is very different. I, in South Africa, um, being a child that's raised in Pretoria, whose culture is very different. Um, mm. And as, as someone else who's raised in, in Ethiopia or who's raised anywhere else, is that there's, so it's more like what the, the African identity then becomes self-love, it becomes self-actualization, it becomes self-expression more than it is about, you know, this, I, I suppose, collective identity because we're all so different. And mm -hmm. I think as, as artists, it's about, um, especially in the film sense, it's about, you know, finding the, 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 the value of specificity, right? Is that if people are going to come and watch something that I have created or something that a filmmaker has created, is they want to know the me. They want right. to know what makes a difference. They want to understand this world that you have created, you know, this fictional world that you have created. And that is always very more specific than it is general. So it's also then, I think for me, in, in, in putting in simple terms, is that you know the African identity is literally, it's more, and I don't wanna use the word individual because mm -hmm. we are more of a collective society, but I think it's very much an inwards thing. It's, it's about that self-actualization coming in and it's literally about loving yourself and being able to take that and put it out there. Yeah. Um, because I think we've been othered for so long, you know, and the, the idea of what an African identity has been defined by the outside. And if we then try and, and, and get to the details of trying to define it, we might get lost mm. in the process. So I think 
we would never escape being you know, an African. If the first thing that you will experience about us is being African, doesn't matter which part we come from. However, we're all very different and all right. very individual. Yeah, and with that being said, Roberta, allow me to also, you know, um, include in this conversation, I mean, uh, based on what Yolanda has said, which is true, we are individuals as Africans. We have, you know, differences in culture, differences in, you know, heritage, traditional practices, uh, understanding and an overview of the continent. But with that being said, can we start have a shared African identity? And if so, how can then fashion and design nurture it? So I think um, if we talk about fashion and design, right, African art, that's even art, art, art in there. African arts, fashion and design has used historical African heritage um, and identities up to now to pass on our rich cultural values. Um, two generations, right? It has helped preserve the link between the past and the present. Um, it is now widely acknowledged um, that heritage is not only manifested through tangible forms, such as your, you know, hard facts, buildings, landscapes, but also through intangible forms, right? Such as our voices, our values, our tradition, and our oral history. And I'll talk about two of the exciting aspects is that we are always, as Africans, right, we are easily identify wherever we go, okay? So we stand out. And even if you look at the diaspora community in terms of the creatives that are there, um, the U.S., you know, Brazil, Africans stand out, right? We lead when it comes to creativity. And other, we basically set the trend and others follow. But unfortunately for us, Due to things like colonialism, you know, and um, we, we, our identity or our image or love for self has been a bit distorted. So, and I think, you know, and also through the educational infrastructure that we have here on the continent, hmm. we've always looked up to the West. And I would like to lead to what Ricky said earlier, is that we were copying the Western culture of hip hop. But what we fail to understand as Africans is that all of the inspiration comes from us, right? We are leading the effort. So I, I see that as a huge renaissance in the creative space, the creative economy, in the sense that Africans are now embracing their own culture and identity. And we are also now connected to the diaspora in that sense. Mm. So jointly, we are changing and moving the way things are being done. And I'll bring it back to fashion, for instance. If you look at all the appropriation and imperialism that occurred over the years with our fashion, I think African fashion designers are now realizing that we actually have significance on a global scale because it can no longer be the Europeans, it can no longer be the Americans. Now, you know, Africa having such a burgeoning young population gives us the platform and the opportunity to really position ourselves. And I think we go with, you know, creativity as the, um, the lead, right? Because it is the only way that we can actually um, change the, the narrative and the mm. paradigm and also lead. And I think we're embracing that as, as Africans. But that being said, because of the fragmented nature, I mean, even within South Africa, I'm sure, you have multiple tribes and languages. And, you know, even looking at it from West, um, South, North Africa, that's why I like AFI as a platform. And I would like to take the opportunity to also congratulate Dr. Um, Presha Mosepe, because what she's doing is bringing the entire continent together and the creativity of a continent together. And that is important. You need platforms that can aggregate the creativity because mm. as a force and a unit, you know, we are hard to break. But if you go in as individuals, then we're, you know, we have no force. So it's really important to start looking at piecing everything together as Africans and really going out there and just moving along as a force. Um, and the ones we're able to do that, trust me, we're going to change things for generations to come. Right, right. And, and you know, talking about changing narratives then, Ricky, is there a need to reshape the African identity, almost so to align to the viewpoint of the 21st century? And do you think there's a role here that should be played or can be played or is already being played uh, by music, fashion and form, do you think? Um, I, I wouldn't say reshape because 
everything is always developing. People are always developing and, and people are always realizing what's important going into the future, what, what they need to leave behind in the past. But I think it's important for us to realize our image is as strong as any other image that we've been fed uh, for all these years. Um, you know, when you think about music specifically and fashion, it's like there's, there's, there's been this, um, there's always like this fetish version of what being African is. And we need to sort of remove the fetish version and actually teach people about Africa, teach people about the different people in Africa, teach people about the different regions in Africa. Mm. So like, like, uh, like, like my sister said, not just to say there's an African identity, but now it's time that we're able to teach people right. what does this fashion mean, where does it come from, what does this language mean, why do they speak like this, what do they eat, mm. you know, we know what they eat in Texas, we know they love barbecue, you know what they, live, what they eat in Paris, we know what they eat in, in different parts of the in world. Paris? Uh, well, in Paris, they eat uh, uh, foie gras. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, so they need to know, Guti, you know, Tina, Sija Matombo on this side, Gune mm. Chogo uh, this side. They need to know those things. So I don't feel like we need to reshape an African identity, but mm. through our music, through our fashion, through our film uh, and television, it's time for us to also teach the world about this region and about this continent and about its people. But the thing that we're always going to keep, I think, is, the, is, is to try to keep a spirit of togetherness, a spirit yeah. of self-love, uh, a spirit of appreciation for, for not just being black, but from being from this place. Absolutely. And, and we talk so much about uh, what to teach other people, particularly outside of the continent. But what about us? What are we teaching ourselves? What are we being influenced by? And, and that's my next question to you as well, uh, Anissa, about what influenced you? You know, what African heritages and, uh, you know, uh, identities influenced you as a woman, an African woman, but also as a founder of your fashion label where you aim to almost speak through your work as well? Um, I think, firstly, we keep on saying em an emerging African identity. I think the core uh, African identity is already established. I think we are a people that... Um, you cannot kind of um, ignore. We are not something that you can kind of pass on. An African person is very clearly <laughs> there and defined. It is there within our culture, is there within uh, the stories that we've been told when we were young. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, the things that really inspired me throughout my design career um, is incredibly diverse and multifaceted. I'm, my origin is, ta I'm Tanzanian, living in South Africa. So part of me understands the, the, the Tanzanian uh, culture. Part of me understands the South African culture. And how do I put that, that all together within a context that people can um, understand through my viewpoint? Um, then becomes such a strong thing for me. Mm. Uh, but the core thing, the thing that makes me who I am was established before, from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Being an African, it's not something that we just learned or it's just by the way, oh, oops, I opened this door and here it is. Mm. No, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are not confused <laughs> about who we are. And because we're not confused, then from there, other things can materialize beautifully. And, and, and with creatives, we are the origin, we are responsible for being the origin stories uh, of different topics. We are the timestamps of what has been happening in the world. Mm. You know in the 1950s, this is how people were dressing. You know in the 1960s, people were dressing like so. Why is that? It's because designers made sure that at that time, they made sure that this story was important and it was to be told at this time. Yeah. Within, uh, so, so with me, inspiration throughout my, my career will always change and, and evolve and be exciting because I, my career is about origin stories. Mm. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And and Nguli, I want to also just uh, uh, include you in this uh, particular, you know conversation and, 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 and just uh, on this point, I mean, the best compliment perhaps that you've received um, from either a local, maybe an international buyer for your work, different aspects um, in terms of, you know, appreciation across the region, what's the common almost, uh, I don't know, a compliment that you receive about your work? I think it's Mostly, the con uh, it's mostly around how I have evolved the designs that I work with, and um, from what they they are, or how they are, the original style of, like for example, in Debele, and evolving that into like a minimalistic, um, more accessible internationally uh, design. Does that make sense? All right. Um, and uh, Roberta, I know that you also need to leave the call as you, you're listening, of course, to our conversation right now. Unfortunately, I would have loved to keep you longer. But before I do, I need to also just ask you this question. Um, briefly, if you may, because I understand you need to leave the call. Every time we speak about African heritage, it seems there's a reference made to African ancestors. Should you know, young Africans right now uh, be almost loyal to ancestry, to, to, to what they stood for, uh, what they introduced to the world as what is African? Or do you think that they are able to take from ancestors and ancestry and build on it? Because at times, often when you say, you know, I am African, they're like, no, no, but your ancestors didn't dress like this. But, but they didn't speak like this. But it, they didn't look like this. Uh, but do you think that is a fair, almost, comparison in this 21st century to be made to ancestry? And should young Africans right now still be committed and loyal uh, to what they introduced to Africa? So... The, I think the biggest challenge to that question is that how are we transferring that knowledge from generation to generation? Because there's a saying, right, that until the lion learns to write, the tale of the hunt is always going to be told by the hunt, uh, by the hunt, right? So the problem that we have in Africa is how we transfer knowledge from generation to generation. Of course. Ancestry is important, culture is important, heritage is important, because that's who we are as a people, okay? I am a Khan, I'm from the Ashanti tribe. Ashanti is known for Kente, is known for Adinkra symbol. These are the things that I have to transfer from, you know, that I've learned growing up as a child, even the Adua and the Kete dance in funerals. You know, my mother insisted that as we're, you know, when we're growing up, that we, we attended a cultural center every summer. And we learned about our culture, about how to do the batik, the tie dye, how to dance, you know, and how to tell stories by the fireside. In Ghana, we call it by the fireside. That is how, you know, the storytelling is. And these, I grew up as a child learning about these things because my mom understood the importance of transferring that information to me. And I'm doing the same with my child but mind you we are in a technology age things are shifting and changing because of technology people have access to information very easily you know information that they didn't have maybe 10 years ago i mean when i was in school we didn't have access to social media instagram and all of those things but my son who's 10 years now he loves to to, um, to do animation He's able to go to YouTube and learn, you know, how to actually <laughs> code and do the animation on his own. So it's a very different generation. And, you know, coupled with technology, things are different. But we still have to ensure that we educate and instill that knowledge. So it's really, and because that's what makes us unique. If you go to India, I live in India, actually, when I was young as well. You will know an Indian, <laughs> you know, even if you met them in, I'll say, uh, in, 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 in London, on the U.S., or in Kentucky, you will know that this person is an Indian by the way they dress, by the food they cook, the way they, they, they still they embrace their culture. 
right? And how they even transfer that knowledge to the next generation. Mm. So why can't we do the same as Africans? The fact that we are, um, you know, kind of adapting to new customs and norms because of, I'll say, um, uh, technology and the fact that we are, okay, okay, there's a rise in middle class industrialization doesn't mean that we have to shift from the who we are as a people. The foundation is important. If it's deeply rooted, it can never be uprooted, right? So we need to set those foundations. And this has to translate in the food we eat, in the culture, in the fashion, you know, in music, in film. We need to find a better way of transferring information from generation to generation. I think that is the problem that we have as Africans. I don't know if it's the uh, something that is a result of colonialism or we just want to be more modern. But most of the time when we, um, you know, we, we get the opportunity to embrace new cultures, we adopt those cultures and forget our own. But we need to protect our identity. We have to protect it not only with, you know, like uh, rhetoric, but also with intellectual property, right? And things that can actually make us gain commercially from our culture and our heritage, you know. So that is what we are missing here. That infrastructure that needs to be put in place to ensure that who we are as a people is commercialized and can be transported to other cultures that can even bring us revenue. And other other people have done it, other countries have done it, you know, we need to be able to do that as well. And this is a conversation right. that will take longer. So I, I want to end it here, but it's a conversation that is not just about us, the creatives. It's a conversation with governments on the policy side. It's a conversation with the creatives, with investors. You know, we all need to come together to really support how we as Africans can transport our culture and make um, you know, gain commercially from All who right. we are as a people. Well, Roberta, thank you so much for joining us on this call and contributing uh, to this uh, conversation. We appreciate your time, and we may release you from this call. Thank you so much. A warm round of applause uh, for Roberta and Nan as she, of course, exits the call. Thank you so much. Thank All right, we're going to move to, to yourself, Yolanda, and I can see that Nguli wants to ask a question to her panelists. But before I, I afford her uh, that opportunity, um, Yolanda, I just want to ask you about gatekeeping in filmmaking, because at times we hear artists saying, we want to create. We want to tell African stories. We want to be a part of, you know, the bigger narrative in shaping the continent. I mean, when we see the likes of Netflix right now, that huge platform in real time that is able to showcase, you know, not only talents, but stories coming from the continent, yet perhaps some may feel there's a lot of gatekeeping. Some may feel economically they're not supported. Um, what's your stance on that? What do you think needs to be done so that creatives are better supported and uh, don't feel confined or the gatekeeping doesn't necessarily confine <coughs> what they want to share with the world. Um, as creatives, I think the the reality of the world that we exist in is that we are we do have to create for an audience, especially when it comes to film. So I think the a lot of the gatekeeping is always based on what the audiences will appreciate or what the audiences um, have perceived to have been liking, and that. Um, and it, by all means, it's always been backed up by, you know, by data, by numbers. But I think um, something like the Squid Game that was very much uh, mm. South Korean and um, was very much about them showed that actually stories that are very unique can still be able to travel, that you actually don't have to change much about yourself. So I think even the, the gatekeepers themselves or the funders and, and the people that do have the financial means to be able to, um, to, to fund film in particular is that that kind of information coming up and them seeing the appreciation and how films that are very specific and, and I'm using Squid Game and even also, I, I think there's also, a, even from a Hollywood point of view, I think Black Panther, the way you would have you would have pitched an African story. It's like there's a lot of stories. Even us as funders, we've tried to sort of like support to take um, to the West before global. I mean, before Black Panther, and it would have been like, no, that is never going to work mm, for our audiences, mm. and that's not what they they into. But post uh, Black Panther, then now people are able to sort of like give filmmakers, you know, a sit at the table and say, tell us about your story. So I think the idea is um, of even of having gatekeepers is, is, is 
has to be evolving or is evolving the same way that um, I suppose identity is, is evolving is because then the introduction of these big platforms are also showing even our our South African gatekeepers, for instance, is that the things that maybe you may that we're not one dimensional, we're not all one thing. The fact that you can have stories that are very niche and be able to have audiences, but also how we then define niche, because I think for the longest time we've defined niche by mass audiences. However, you could still have a very, um, I suppose, very niche story. And I think the way you would then define, or the way we're now defining um, that the, the audiences and its success mm. is that if you intended a film for a, a niche audiences and it does actually get to that niche audiences then you have succeeded in what you, you set out to do because I think the idea of then being able to say that success is only when it hits you know the the entire globe it, that is that is that's setting us up for failure yeah so it's also then just being able to say okay what did we intend to do if we're going to make a film that is about queer community and they are your first audiences mm. and if they receive that then that in in itself or in, that film has succeeded if you're making a blockbuster then then you can judge it by masses and you can judge it by the numbers yeah but in your experience Ricky have you ever felt censored um, in terms of your you're telling your story either through your music videos, through your art, your work, your merch. Have you felt censored? I know that YouTube and the likes online have created that platform where you can be uh, as free and authentic and as uncensored as possible. But when it comes to also probably examples of traditional media um, or whatever platform that you try to penetrate, did you feel uh, censored? Uh, I, I mean, before when we were playing by the rules, we, 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 we felt uh, censored a lot. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't say censored. I think, um, like you were talking about, it, 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 sometimes there's a demand that can be backed up by data. And because we felt we were niche, we didn't have, we were doing something niche, we didn't have the data to back up, uh, to present to anybody and say, this is what we can do and mm. this is what we want to do, give us an opportunity. Only later in life we realized that that's how things work. You have to be able to present that there are people who are going to take your product, you know? So we sort of use that frustration to build the underground up, you know? Like, uh, there's something cool about still being a bit underground too. There's something cool about being a bit niche. There's something cool about throwing a party where there's only 10 people and then and next door there's a party with two, 200 or 1,000 yeah. people. And we have to sort of appreciate that as artists sometimes, you know, sometimes we get drawn into what we see on social media, it's always huge and it's always big. But then when you realize the communities have to sort of build slowly and you have to sort of, you have to grow your niche and, and the more you grow your niche, the more you don't have to be censored and the mm. people who are like you are going to follow you. So we've sort of managed to do that somehow and we've sort of, we've stopped being frustrated right. by being, uh, uh, having to be in a certain box or having to look a certain way or having to speak a certain way to be on a certain platform. Mm. And since we've done that, platforms come to you after that, you know, and mm. th that's sort of cool. But yeah, we did have a feeling of being censored until we realized that there's just too many people that are just like you. Mm. You just have to go find yeah. them. That's a very insightful point. All right, I want to give uh, Nkuli an opportunity. Nkuli, I understand that you wanted to ask a question to a panelist, Nkuli. All right, it seems that uh, your picture is frozen at the moment. So we'll continue, of course, with our conversation while we, we wait on fixing that. But also, I, I, I kind of sensed you agreeing with uh, Ricky in that front. Um, but also, also, what do you think then the role of the media can be in assisting as platforms? Or do you think, you know, gone are the old traditional mediums. We're seeing more of the social media, new media disruptions uh, is where it's at, especially with the advent of uh, technology. Um, I can truly say I've gone through the first part where the traditional sense of media truly existed and truly ran the show to me being able to control the narrative mm -hmm. and make sure that I speak to the right people at the right time with the right story. Um, and social media for me personally within my business and also across uh, the, the, the different principles, music, uh, film, um, 
the fact that I can control it myself uh, within this little uh, <laughs> black mirror, so to speak, um, uh, becomes then such a powerful tool. Um, and no longer am I uh, kind of washed down or um, lost in translation or any any of that I can truly say oh this is this is what I'm about this is what I'm, this is uh, what I stand for but also seeing what the actual um, uh, the, the, the the everyday ins and outs of of being a, a creative person seeing things that are really beautiful um, on a runway that takes sometimes 7.5 minutes mm. is something that you have been working on for six months, seven months, and prior to that, you've been sitting and dreaming. So for you, by the time you're walking out the runway and you're saying thank you everyone for coming and for, for, for watching the show, so much has happened with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. uh, and, and the question that I always find so funny after every show that I've ever done in my life <laughs> um, is you come out and you're sweating, uh, yeah. huffing and puffing, and people ask you, oh, Anissa, that was a great show, so what's next? Yeah. <laughs> and you sit there and you, and you kind of, you're like, but that was what's next. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was th it. That, that, that's what was coming, because it's been sitting in my studio for mm. a very long time. Media hasn't been in my studio, right? But now, because of social media, you can be in my studio, mm. and you from Tanzania or from Germany or from Kentucky, you all can be involved in the story and in the making. And actually, at the moment, um, uh, 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 kind of creating a culture within the, 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 the media space, within social media space, has now become even, uh, it's, it's even stronger now. Mm. I mean, look at Elsa, uh, Elsa from uh, Kenya. She was just sitting in her room um, with her um, hair uh, um, all messy and with sunglasses and speaking things that we think about every day and we can't dare to say. Mm. But because she was true to herself and she, she understood that media, her, her, her power was in this handphone, that made her a huge success. But what I, I would like to personally see is more of that, more right. of uh, Elsa Majimba to people like, uh, uh, I don't know, all, all these YouTubers, let's say, that are making it very, very, very big in, um, in, in for example, the US. Mm -hmm. And because we have that power here to do that, the time then becomes more exciting because now if, like the world is truly yeah. your oyster, yeah. truly. I couldn't agree more. And we've seen that even with the COVID-19 pandemic, how uh, art, design, musicians, uh, fashion designers truly making the most, uh, whether it was virtual you mm. know, fashion shows and showcasing, absolutely amazing. All right, with that being said, allow me to take some online questions. And if I could be just ask my teleprompter, to move some of those, um, you know, uh, questions I'm seeing there. I want to start with uh, Ricky, this site. All right, I'm going to get to that in a moment. But Ricky, there's a question for you. Actually, if you may just scroll this site, please. It says, what can, this is for you, Ricky, uh, what can the music industry teach other artists, just in terms of collaborating and creating culture as a collective? Uh, and what can, yeah, the music industry definitely teach uh, as a collective? So repetition there. Um... Music sounds better when a lot of hands have touched it. It sounds better when different spirits have listened mm. to it and, and given you feedback. Um, it sounds better when you've allowed uh, people to experience what you were experiencing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think it's the same with fashion. It's the same with, with business, you know? You don't want to be at the top of an, at the office and on the top floor and you're the only person telling everyone what to do, it never works out. It works out when everybody can tell you, hey, I think we should do this, I think we should try that. Mm. And the music community now, the way, the way we work, we have 10, 20 people sometimes, just, sometimes just giving you that feeling. Sometimes the other person is just in the corner just giving you a dance. And we're starting to welcome more people into a room before we take out a product. And we're starting to welcome more people that you might think, oh, we don't need them on the song, but mm. they can definitely bring something in. And I think 
we can take that into every aspect of our lives uh, as much as we're comfortable with, you know. We have to start including more people into what we're trying to create. And I think we'll be able to resonate with more people, you know. Yeah. And um, it's just like, just trying to really keep it pure and not just trying to say, this is what I was dreaming about and here it is. No, we have to listen and let people be involved a bit more. And music is doing that. And, and, and fashion needs to start doing that. Um, not in a sense where they just yeah. like see something on Instagram and then they do it for themselves, right. you know? They need to send a flight ticket and bring that person over from Nigeria or from Ghana mm. and say, okay, come to Paris and explain to us what you've been doing, you know? Uh, uh, um, come from, coming from, from South Africa, there's so many um, influences, like we, we get into meetings and there's like these mood boards and like, <clears throat> and on the mood boards, it's always like my friends and yeah. they've got like 500 followers and like 300 followers and they have no idea that they're in this mood board for this huge, you know, global company, you know, and they have no idea. They don't even know what they posted means anything to anybody in the world. They were just doing it mm. because they just felt like doing a post. They have no idea that they've influenced someone 3,000 miles away, 12,000 kilometers away. They have no idea. Mm. And that's the sad part. The sad part is when people who are inspiring the rest of the world don't get the opportunity to come into the room. Mm. And I think, I guess that's what AFI is, is here to do and that's what AFI has been doing is by making sure that everybody is in the room when, when we're making decisions specifically on African fashion. Everybody's got to be in the room. Right. And yeah, that's what we've been doing with music. So that's how we collaborate. Yeah. So what I'm hearing more and more is inclusion, inclusion, inclusion uh, can be more important yeah. um, at this point. All right, Nguli, there's a question that I would like to direct to you. It's coming from, you know, those who are posing questions online. If you may, Nguli, answer this question. It says, hi, do you not think the overly use, um, the overly focus rather on Africa as a hindrance on creativity, especially because other continents don't do it, um, they just design. What's your perspective on this, Nguli? I, I, I think that there needs to be a balance. Um, I was actually Googling uh, African fashion and what comes up on the first page when you Google African fashion is the um, uh, wax print um, textiles. And that, and I have big questions about that because, first of all, those are not even produced in Africa. Those are Dutch produced in the Netherlands. And I'm wondering if we need to get to a point, like just like in music, everybody's talking about ownership and owning your masters and all of those things. And we know that the world has been exploiting the continent so much in terms of like resources and all of that. And our culture has been exploited so much all around the world and people are commercializing and making a lot of money out of the African, so-called African culture. And therefore, I'm curious hmm. if we are, by just constantly um, maybe be in that space of, um, you know, trying to prove and to be seen by the world, trying to educate the world, trying to, if that is holding us back, should we be in a position where we are actually thinking about creating our own meals, making the fabrics in Africa, growing our own cotton, and, um, focusing on bringing back the economy to the continent. Um, because also, if you look at a trend forecasting, the trends are defined in Europe before they get anywhere else. And um, yeah, should we, be folk, should we be deciding our own trends in the continent? I'll speak from an interior design uh, space. What happens is that you, every maybe two, three years, the trend forecasters will say, Africa's trending or India's trending and therefore every single buyer is looking at Africa's like oh we're all going to go to Africa and buy but five years from then Africa's no longer trending Peru is trending or Colombia is trending and then they go there and we have uh, built this industry you're producing and producing thinking that these international people are still going to export your product but they've already moved on because the trends are no longer in Africa. So should we be defining our own trends? We should be focusing on our own markets and building um, 
uh, clientele and, 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 you know, building our own um, uh, ecosystem as opposed to trying to still fit in in Europe, still yeah. want to be seen. So, you know, let's just, let's just go away from that and let's just focus on us. And we've, I feel like we've also been working at trying to get these people to see us. We've been working at like trying to educate them about Africa. We've been, I think it's enough now. I think we should be innovating. We should be looking at building machines and building new things and, and trying out things as opposed to just kind of like waiting for Europe to like us, to approve and all of that. Mm. That's kind of like what I'm thinking about. It. Yeah. And I have to admit, that's very thought-provoking. That's very thought-provoking, even for the entire value chain in fashion, um, you know, in design, in filmmaking, and in music, just the whole creative industry. That's, that's something to think about there, Nguli. All right, I want to uh, bring a question here, uh, which I saw for Yolanda, if you may. Um, Yolanda, question coming from, you know, our online viewers asking, um, is there a difference in storytelling styles in Africa uh, compared in Western uh, countries? And what does this mean, then, for African creators? Um, there definitely is very different styles in the way um, we tell our stories. I think a lot of our stories, for instance, in South Africa, as um, I think now we are getting to a point where we can tell our own stories, but I think for the longest time our stories were very much influenced by by, by, by Hollywood, and that's because we, we grew up watching that content. Um, film schools teach in a syllabus that is very much set on the Hollywood, so therefore the filmmakers that come from those schools will tell the stories in, in, in that kind of way. But then if you watch, for instance, a film from Burkina Faso, it will be very different in texture, it will be very different in, in terms of even just like if I may use something as simple as dialogue, like our stories in South African, they're very much dialogue driven. Mm. Whereas if you look at the stories from North Africa, they're very much about their aesthetics. They, they, there's a lot of silence and it's almost like they can communicate a lot through silence and just observation and watching. Um, and like ours where we, we're speaking as we, as we go. So I think the whole continent when it comes to how we tell our stories is, um, it's, it's very different and also is at the at at, at, at some level very much rooted in, in how we, we brought up and how we experience or how our culture is. Um, I think as South African we're very vibrant, we're very out loud and um, so therefore that comes across in the kind of stories that we tell. And if you in and if you look at other stories from the other parts of the world, they or even in South Africa they're very different. Mm. So I think even in, and, and I suppose it, it, it goes back to the, the fact that there is, a, and a, we've debated in other circles around the idea of a, an African film. Mm. Um, and, and, and the same way that Europeans would be like, there's no such a thing as a European film, when we've said, well, but we know how your films look like. And I think, um, the, I think the, the power in telling our stories is we have to tell stories that reflect who we are as the first audiences. I think um, even we, we want, as societies, we want stories that engage and reflect our experiences and our lived realities. Um, but also at the same vein, I think we want stories that reimagine, you know, as and almost more futuristic um, as opposed to just reflecting, not, I suppose this goes back to not just reflecting the past, but mm. what could we be? How, how do we reimagine ourselves if we had to change? And I suppose the idea then of film is it's us being able to play around with what could be, mm. but also then being able to to, to collaborate with other artists, collaborate um, with fashion designers and have things that when you're watching a film, all these things are coming up naturally, the music, um, the, the, the design, the costumes. And I think as mm. artists, if, because then we're not just taking one form of art when, when you're going out, you're taking all of this 
collective and they seem more natural and more organic yeah. when we do that, that collaboration. And I want to just build on that before I, I, I give you know, the next question to Anissa, because you mentioned a quite an important point there about what you heard, that there's no such as a European film. And I just wonder, in as much as we want to create films in Africa from Africans, by Africans, uh, that tell the African story, where's then that thin line uh, between that and feeding into stereotypes, into African stereotypes? What is a typical African film supposed to look like? Um, and, and, and would that not then be feeding into stereotypes? I mean, if we still hear that, um, you know, some people overseas think there are animals and lions roaming around, you know, urban metros such as, you know, Johannesburg, uh, should we not be looking at those films that feed into stereotypes? But where's the thin line, do you think? I think if we reflect our experience as it is, and I think, um, but also then find ways of being able to, 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 to be creative and push the envelope, I don't think we need to try and, and box ourselves to what is an African, um, is an African film, because it's, it's something that we are struggling to, uh, to, to define, and perhaps we should let go of trying to define it and just create, because I think more than anything, if we are just creating, like who you are mm. will come across. Every artist lives um, themselves in the work that they do, mm. whether you're a filmmaker or, you, um, or you're a fashion designer. So I don't think we should worry about the terms as much, more than we should just be creating our content and trying to get it to, um, to, to not just leave the continent, but also create South African content that can live and be appreciated in Nigeria and in Kenya. And also, I think at the same time, um, as sitting in South Africa, be able to receive um, mm. content that is coming from other parts of, of, of the continent. Be able to sit and receive a, a film that's coming from Burkina Faso, that's coming from Morocco. Uh, because I think that if we want them to be able to, 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 to sort of like engage with our culture, then we need to engage with that culture. And I think then in that we'll also realize how diverse and how nuanced we are as, yeah. a, as a people. All right. Well, more questions uh, coming up online. Anissa, this one's for you. And it's the same question posed uh, to Ngule a bit earlier on. The best compliment that you've received from a local or international buyer for your work. And are there different aspects that buyers appreciate across different regions? Uh, oh, I can't really think of one thing that has been a big compliment apart from the fact that I can reach people beyond my continent, I think that is a quite a big compliment for me because that means whatever I'm saying and wh whatever story I'm telling mm -hmm. is going beyond, beyond the borders that I'm, I naturally can move across. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about being African, whether you are from the south or east or west, uh, there's always something that you can relate to when you go to Nairobi, when you go to uh, Ghana, when you, you know, you, th there's always something, there's a familiarity there. Mm. So I think the biggest compliment for me is the fact that my uh, clothes have reached people far and wide. Uh, uh, just the other day, I got a, a, a message from a, a lady in Germany saying to me, oh, somebody from somewhere was speaking about your clothes, and that's why I'm reaching out to you. And this is a big retailer, which means it's not only the big things that you see on, it's not an announcement. Mm. It's the conversations that kind of happen in the corridor. Hey, I really like your shirt dress. Where's that from? I've never seen it before. Oh, it is from this brand in this place. In, in this particular area. And that, that kind of, I think for me, starts canceling the romanticized idea of Africa mm. and shows what truly we are. Because they see that, uh, they see that item and they identify with that item and they, get, and they say to themselves, I'm curious enough to ask you who it is and I'm also curious enough to go online and type www and purchase it. And that's what we've had been doing for the past uh, 15 years. And for me, that is a beautiful thing. And at the moment, because everyone is stuck on their screens, it's even a better moment because then now we can, we can push, it, push that story even harder. Yeah. Because now, then we, because naturally we're loud, 
<laughs> Africans, naturally, we're loud. And it's time for us to be louder. Um, I like uh, South Korea was mentioned. Two countries um, that have really inspired me the past two years is South Korea and Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And through the intense history that they've gone through, have managed to quickly turn themselves around and really be self-sufficient within themselves and then after that then tell their stories above and beyond. I cannot tell you how much K-drama I've been watching. It's fascinating <laughs> for me. Yeah. Not only the fashion because that's an obvious thing, but even their, their, their cultural ways uh, the, 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 the diverse nature I can identify with. And that is, it's, it's that, that experience, it's from another space and mm. another content. So I'm taken somewhere else. So when I'm sitting and I'm uh, sketching an idea for a collection, um, the, that, that, the, the fact that I feel inspired to do that because I saw something from another, another place, I, I suppose that's the compliment, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, with that being said, I mean, I'm going to leave our online questions at that for now because uh, we've come almost towards the end of our engagement. But you have mentioned, you know, a word that I would like to phrase or use an, uh, a question that I'd like to phrase um, as my last question to all of you as a panelist, and then I will give you again another opportunity to give your closing remarks. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading around the attention economy, uh, and that has to do with social media and how there are attention engineers that play a role in the reasons why we are on our screens so much. When you wake up, first thing you do is check your notifications. When you wake up, you get that you know, adrenaline. When you hear that notification uh, ring on your phone, attentive to opinions, attentive to what you consume. So with that being said, I suppose my question to you each is, before I give you your closing remarks uh, opportunity, starting with you, uh, Ricky, is what should Africans be attentive to in this attention economy? What should we be consuming? What should we be reading about? How should we be learning more about ourselves, redefining ourselves, paying attention to, so that we can further explore our themes and topics as this today? Well, um, I'm not going to give anyone advice when it comes to phones or devices or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, I've got my own lessons to learn, but what I would say is that um, uh, let's get outside more. Mm. Um, Africa's so huge. There's so many different countries and different people all over, and specifically for South, for South Africans that I've had the most experience with, we just don't travel as much. We don't we don't go to our neighboring countries just for a vacation. Mm. Mm. And I feel like that's something we need to do more. We need to really get out into the rest of the continent. Um, I know it's very nice to go to Cape Town in December, but it's also nice to go to Ghana and Nigeria oh, yeah. in December. Um, and we need to just teach each other to start exploring our continent a bit more. Mm. Um, and, and, and like she's saying, go see what's happening in Burkina Faso, go right. see what's happening in Morocco. You know, if over the course of the next 10 years, um, African children could actually travel Africa more mm -hmm. and save their money to go into other areas in Africa, um, I think the phone, what being stuck on our phones is not going to be such a big issue, you know? Yeah. Got you, got you. And Nguli, for you, what should we be paying attention to? Because I think being you, being truly African, is still a conversation we yet to explore, even if it's not in a room like this. But when you're alone in your room, uh, looking at yourself in the mirror, uh, but what should we be paying attention to so to at least get to those answers? We're struggling to hear you, Nguli. If audio can please just uh, help us to hear Nguli, please. Can you hear me now? Hear yes, now? we can hear you now, Nguli, yes? Yes, yeah, so I think the key thing that I'm fascinated about right now, personally, is the idea of the so-called, um, the unofficial economy. Uh, in South Africa, it's called township economy. Um, I think, there's such beauty in how trade is happening in our neighborhoods and how um, 
you know, I read an, a, an interesting article where somebody was talking about like how with architecture, for example, um, in South Africa, it's a long history that you have Abu Maslandi, you know, you have the people who own the house and then you have people who came from other neighboring cities who mm. came to work in Joburg and then they can rent the house at the top of the house kind of thing. They can rent like a shed or whatever. That's an economy that nobody talks about. Everyone's always talking about like, oh, why aren't you building houses? People need houses, etc., etc. But that's also an interesting way of like creating homes for people. And that for me is fascinating, township economy, this kind of social economy that's happening in our neighborhood. I also think that the creative economy, I think that our um, continent needs to pay more attention to the creative economy. And by that, I, you know, I mean from anything from graphic design to somebody who's doing beading to, um, yeah, because that plays such a massive role in the country's economy, but often it's taken for granted and perhaps not even explored fully. Mm. Um, if we, if you look at like how many young South Africans are making the most beautiful, sickest videos or dance videos, I have never seen anything like that in the world. But how can they monetize of such things? How can the women who are uh, sitting at the Rosebank Free Market actually monetize of their good work without somebody trying to hustle them to get a discount? How do you actually value that economy as part of, just as much as mining brings um, money in the country, creativity brings so much into the country's economy. So I feel like we should be paying more attention to those spaces and seeing how we can, you know, people talk, are talking about an unemployment issues and all of those things. How do we actually pay attention to those things because they can, um, you know, change so much in, in, in the country's economy. So I, I feel like we should be thinking about that a little bit more. Yeah. Absolutely. Paying attention, of course, to what we pay attention to um, is important. Um, I want to give an opportunity. I want to give an opportunity to um, everyone that is in-house right now uh, that wants to ask a question. Uh, perhaps you have a burning question or even a comment that you want to pose to our panelists. We do have a roving mic, I think. Uh, you can just raise your hand and uh, sure, they can give you the mic. Okay, hi. Uh, hello? Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Babna. I'm from France. And uh, I grew up between Paris and New York, actually. Uh, but I, my background is in uh, sports, sports business. And recently, like a few years ago, I just changed to I added a few, few more things, which is creative industry and fashion. I've heard everything you said. And my, one of the questions is, if, will AFI grow internationally, meaning AFI Paris? like they do during the New York Fashion Show. And also, you talk about film. Hmm. Um, I believe um, the, the issue that we have is the communication, because we don't have many big media talking about African fashion. Um, I'm saying this because in 2018, we were in Cannes with Spike Lee for his movie. Uh, your dress code that everybody must wear something. So I purposely put an African kiss your stuff on me. So at least I'm dressed European, but I have something African. And I added Mama Winnie pins just nearby. Uh, I've realized that most of the African and black uh, entertainers, right. nobody wanted to wear any African outfits. There is one artist, her name is Rose Palaris. She's from Angola. And she is, she was, um, she gained, she, she, she won the prize by um, the uh, Mastercard Foundation. She had a lot of African outfits out there. Most of the Af black people who were entertainers and invited, they, were, they wanted to wear Balenciaga, Dior, and um, uh, for instance, I was happy when I went to visit the Little shop. Finally, we have a perfume from an African designer. But everybody's going to rush to Christian Dior or Louis Vuitton or all that. The problem, mm. my question is, and my point is, what are we doing in, for all the people who have the power mm. to push our own image? 
in our narrative, we talk about black Panthers. Right. I was surprised, but people were all surprised about black Panthers. We as Africans, we dress like that all the time. Yeah. So it was no surprise for us. Yeah. So why is all of, all of a sudden something surprising? Is be, do we try to cater to other people's perception that we need to fit into their mainstream? Mm -hmm. We talk about Mandela shirt all the time that you know went global. All right. Is that even? We know more presidential shirt than Patio and so forth. All right. Definitely got your question. Very my question, interesting. My, my question is: Shall we not push put more investment in communication and media to push that narrative because? The perception is reality. It doesn't right, mean it's true. Right, right. So that's my, my and, and is that question directed to anyone specifically? Yeah, the question is, shall we not invest more in media and right. advertising for black entertainers? Beyonce has done more for African fashion right. than any African top OK, artist. but my question is, is it directed to any of the panelists? Yeah, any everybody. specific? Yeah. Anyone can answer. Yeah, to everybody. Can All right, answer. OK. Let me just take two more, and then I'll bring it to our panelists. All right, there's a hand in the front. Please, thank you. Try and be brief, please. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, my question really is based on the fact that as, an, as a stylist or anyone in fashion, music, uh, film, you're searching for recognition, or like Ricky said, uh, your own people should find your people. Mm. Now, when that recognition is not found, like you keep on creating content energy, but you can't find that recognition, how do you deal with that as, as opposed to anyone? Yeah. How do you deal with that? And is, how is the AF, AFI trying to bridge that, like help with that? Mm. Because it's a platform, is it not? Right. So how do you bridge that? How do you deal with that? All right. I'm going to take that question for, for Ricky, but I'm not sure if you can answer on behalf of AFI, uh, but just more on your personal experience. And perhaps the first question, let me pose it to you, uh, Yolanda, and then as we get ready for more questions, so that we don't forget uh, yes. the questions, right? Yes. All right, Yolanda, perhaps maybe answer the question around communication and uh, the media, because as the gentleman made mention there, we know more about the Mandela shirts, um, we know more about the presence of, you know, the likes of Beyonce's brands on the continent, um, and the role that the media then can play, if you can answer that. And Ricky can take the qu second question. Um, I think the I think we also I, I, I mean we we also from the films that we we get involved in I think the the media and in terms of just doing reviews or being able to take out them out there is something that we also struggle with. Um, and if the question then is what can media do? I think it would be being able to um, include more of the of our artists include, like make a big deal of Jamil Kubega doing a film as much as you do um, when Martin Kosseze does. So I think it really is about, I would say from media, my request would be about hyping up our artists the mm. same way that we do with international artists. And that's, that would be my request. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right, Ricky? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe on the, on the, on the sort of, on both of the questions. Um, what, you know, if I go to, um, if we have a movie premiere right now, and this was the movie premiere, and we go to uh, a Lag Duma or a Tebe, mm. a Tebe Makoko, or even yourself, and we ask you, can we please get uh, some outfits here, our movie stars? Would you be able to create, would you, able, would you be able to give away a hundred suits no. on the spot? No. And so I'm, I'm not saying that it's not true that people do want to wear Balenciaga and Prada, but we have to understand that a lot of our African and local brands are not yet at the phase where they can say, you're going to a movie premiere, here are five outfits. Hmm. Uh, they can't send you a box full of clothes that you're going to wear for the whole season. They, they, they can't do that yet. So as the creatives that I guess that have the platforms to wear those brands, from what I've seen in South Africa and Africa, uh, Beyonce is very late. Uh, yes. African artists and African creatives yes. have been supporting African fashion for, uh, mm. for, for, forever. Mm. Beyonce is very, very late on that front. Um, the issue is the peop our own people have to be able to add to the economy mm. for those brands to be able to have a, 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 bigger, um, uh, a bigger footprint, you know, because I've been to London and I've seen Macrosa, you know, I've, I've been to Paris and I've seen Tebe, but maybe only a couple, 
and maybe he's going to develop to the point where he can have uh, an, 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 an office on St. Honor Road, or maybe they can have uh, an, an office in uh, a, 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 a setup at Selfridges or at Harrods. Mm. But since we're not there yet, it's really up to the individuals. That one person, that Angolan, that Angolan artist, instead of saying, why can't more do more of that, we should just be sh clapping our hands mm. like you did. You mentioned the name, and you, uh, we should be clapping our hands and saying, next time, we should see more of that because it's going to take us time. Mm. You're dealing with, you're dealing with uh, 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 white companies that have been around for hundreds, uh, hundreds of years. Right. You know, so I feel like we just shouldn't say we don't represent our brands. We definitely do. Mm. But the brands that I love, uh, being the person that I am, and mm. I'm able to give them as many impressions on social media as I can, they still can't even afford to give me something. I still have to go buy it. For me to buy it, I also still have to afford it. You mm. understand what I'm saying? So I think that let's not like, be tough on, on, on black people not wearing African artists, because I think they do. We just need to also take out and get the investors mm -hmm. and invest in black mm -hmm. businesses, black fashion brands, mm -hmm. so they can get to a stage. You know, Nike can send you all 100 shoes right now, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, we're just not there yet, you know? Yeah, all right. Um, can we have uh, more questions? Also bearing in mind that uh, we have five minutes left uh, to this and we have to give our panelists at least some few seconds to give closing statements. Uh, yes, lady. Um, good afternoon. My name is Brista Kamaria from Congo. And I have a question regarding movies, right? As you said, um, you do not identify European movies or um, American movies, they're just movies. And the stigma of falling into this um, African movie. Um, my question comment is, we do not literally have to change our ways to fit into their narrative. Mm. For instance, the Roomba of Congo that transitioned into today's Afro beats and Afro pop that is now featured Justin Bieber, Wizkid re recently went to LA and performed. She, he stayed, or we stayed original to our trance. We didn't go R&B, we stayed original to our trance. So in the film industry, why do we have to change to try and accommodate the world when Koreans are taking over doing their thing. Mm. When Nigerians are taking over doing their thing, mm. why do we have to try and fit into America and Europe to be accepted if we are accepted with our creativity as mm. we are? Good question. All right. Um, can we get a second hand, if we may, please? Is there another hand? All right, we have another hand there to ask a question. My name, is, hi. my name is Naomi from Just Trimmings, and my question or comment rather would be posed to all of you is, where is African fashion going exactly? I, how do I put this? So, there are Eurocentric silhouettes. Eurocentric silhouettes and then African textiles and African prints. Mm. I'm wearing a jacket right now and I can put African prints on it and say it's African. There's, so, there's only so much you can do to accommodate fashion and then call it African. What are distinctive African trademarks to be like when I'm wearing something that is screaming Africa, that is screaming heritage of this continent, as opposed to putting print on something that's European and then saying that it's African. Because mm. you can only go so much, then we're going to get bored of long silhouettes and belted gowns, and then you're calling it fashion. Where exactly is African fashion going in that regard? Because right. then it's a box. Thank you so much for that question. And Gule, I saw you nodding your head uh, listening to that question. Perhaps let me give you that question for you to answer. And Anissa, if you don't mind, let me give you the question around fitting in sure. uh, to answer. Nguli, may you please just answer that question around for us that we've just heard right now? I, I think it's a very good question. I don't know if I personally have an answer, but I have maybe uh, just some thoughts because I think about that a lot. Not just African fashion, but African design as a whole. Um, 
And um, I put some questions here, and one of the questions that I'm asking myself is, is Africa, is, when are we talking about African fashion or African design? Are we talking about an aesthetic? Are we talking about the, the geography? Are we talking about mindset, the lifestyle? And can we actually define all of that? Is it, because for me, when I, there's like the aesthetic part of it, which is now what is presented as African fashion is the um, white print and what the, uh, the, the, the audience, the person in the audience just mentioned. But then you have like, you know, people like, and Latina, like, uh, you know, they're creating everything from scratch in their own spaces and, um, you know, using, like, like, designing it from scratch, using the materials from uh, locally produced and, you know, working with the artisans uh, that are based in South Africa. And also, uh, I feel like there's a few people, and Teb is one of them, Latina is one of them, and um, there's a, a, a whole lot of other people who are in that space where I feel they are actually redefining it and they are creating it and then not mm. just taking and doing something uh, on there. Um, I think um, there's still, what, when I think about African fashion, when I think about fashion in general, there's a lot of questions about climate. There's a lot of question about the injustice that's happening in the uh, fashion space, the destructiveness and the, you know, right. how um, people are being exploited in the Chinese um, factories, etc. And so, I, and also another interesting thing that's happening in the continent, which I don't think we are talking about as much as we should be, is the fact that Europe and America are dumping their old clothes in the continent, which is then causing big climate problems in the continent, all over the continent. Um, and so I think um, we need to go beyond the surface. It's not just like the finished thing. It's it's an industry. It's an mm -hmm. ecosystem. It's um, how we are empowering the local artisans. It's you know who's wearing these things. How much um, we are producing and how much we are paying our artisans and how much we are selling it for. And is our audience even willing to pay? Like I know that there were people complaining about rich industries. Right. Um, clothing, saying that it's too expensive, um, but you know they can buy Louis Vuitton back at cost twenty thousand. But when it's a South African person, then they can't. So I think it's like a whole thing, it's a whole bigger conversation than just like um, uh, a piece of dress, you know. And I think that it hasn't happened enough, and we still need to engage and all right. figure out all those all right. things. Sure. Thank you so much, Nguli, for that. And, uh, uh, you know, due to time, I'll let you also just answer the question. And because I'm looking at the time now, there's another, um, you know, uh, side of this experience that I have to allow you to experience. I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, please, then, just, just answer the question and perhaps as briefly as you can. Um, I think as somebody who pays attention to fashion, you must also ask yourself, who am I paying attention to? Because the question went to uh, approaching one part, one very small part of design, and that is African print. That is one type of print. There are so many African designers who aren't approaching it with an African print. Many of them, not only from South Africa, many from uh, the, the West Africa, East Africa, North Africa. So as if, if you're finding yourself seeing things and things are becoming monotonous, you need to ask yourself, oh, have I actually diversified my interest? Because many times you find yourself, mm. you're like, oh, hang on a minute. I've only, like the way we go, the, we are creatures of habit. Mm. You know, you go, you do something, you come back because you already understand and know what the result is. But then if you push yourself further and say, okay, I know designers from this space and they do this, great. But then what about the others? What right. are they doing? And once you see that, you find it's not only African print. Mm. 
Very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Anissa, for your contribution to this conversation. Thank you so much, Riki Rik, for joining us. And uh, thank you as well, Yolanda. Nguli, I appreciate your time uh, joining us. And in abstention, Roberta, we also thank her uh, for joining in. I would have loved to get some closing comments, but those, unfortunately, would have to be uh, the closing comments uh, for this afternoon. And this masterclass, uh, where we are, of course, making a call to action as AFI to be you, be truly African. And uh, to explore more of that, please do stick around because there's the official, uh, I understand, opening happening at 5 p.m. I would have loved to stay around and join you for that, but please make sure that you stick around for the official opening uh, starting at 5 p.m. and you can engage uh, with the AFI officials world to ask more questions around you know, how they're helping. I saw another question uh, that was asked around the master classes, what they meant to do, how they're going to help fashion designers. I felt it being unfair that our uh, you know, panelists would answer that, but the officials are here uh, you know, from the AFI organization that you can engage with uh, for more on how you can perhaps even collaborate or you can get more information around how, of course, uh, you can uh, just expand uh, on your potential. But thank you so much. And hopefully this was insightful and impactful and appreciate you for allowing me to be your host this afternoon. I'm Tumela Mutudwane and uh, we'll see you again next time should this opportunity come again. Thank you. Well done, you too. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to be in Paris to do my studies, but I'm always embracing my culture. You know, Madagascar is always with me everywhere I'm going. My Africa is always with me. I'm targeting uh, the middle class millennials who are passionate about fashion, like to dress well, they are starting to build careers. In a perfect world, we'd really like to do everything locally. That's something that would be, um, I think, really great for a lifestyle brand to not only be based in Africa, but everything sourced from the material. I specifically target uh, men because we try to celebrate um, individualism. We want um, our clients to, to really express themselves through our clothing.